Thank you. Worked before. Ah, okay. That looks better. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Okay, good afternoon. So it's a big pleasure and a big honor to be here. Thanks a lot to all the people responsible for that. I'm not talking about quantum information. I take the spin and correlation part of the session title. So I'm going to talk about non-local correlations inside dynamical means field calculations, and I will actually do it for real materials, but I will kind of focus on a specific class of materials that is already indicated here. The nice thing of being the third, fourth speaker uh, talking about correlated systems and dynamical mean field theory is that one can keep the introduction short. So you have understood that we are talking here about materials where Coulomb interactions are important, compete with the kinetic energy, and can induce completely new effects. In the strong coupling limit, where the Coulomb interactions would entirely dominate, you can induce mod insulating behavior. That means you can localize the electrons. And you should think of these solids rather uh, as collections of atoms where the electron behaves like in an atom and do not spread out like in Bloch, Bloch theory over the whole crystal. So if we look at the two limits, so the strong coupling limit, mod insulator, the weak coupling limit, band picture, what happens in between? Well, in between you can think of the solid or a specific atomic site, a correlated site in the solid, as a site where Things can happen like in a movie. You have an electron hopping there, a second electron coming there, interacting with the first one, one hopping away. So you have quantum fluctuations locally on that given site. And this is precisely what DMFT focuses on, incorporating into the electronic structure theory description this little movie of quantum fluctuations, local Coulomb interaction-induced phenomena on a given transition metal or F electron uh, site is what DMFT incorporates in the description. And that enables you to describe both the weak coupling, band insulating, and the strong coupling limit. More technically speaking, this means that DMFT constructs an approximation to the many body self energy, which in the general case should be dynamical, that means frequency dependent or energy dependent, and orbital and momentum dependent, K okay, dependent. And it approximates that self-energy by a thing which now becomes momentum independent or a local self-energy, which is calculated from an effective problem where essentially you look at your movie on a specific atom and the bath here is mimicking the reminder of the solid. Technically, that means you couple your effective atom problem to a self-consistent bath in a local quantum impurity problem. So by construction, your self-energy is local because it is determined from this effective atom problem. But beware, local here does not mean local in the uh, potential in the electronic structure sense, but has a specific meaning in the many body sense, namely that it means local if you consider real space representation in a Vanier basis with atomic sites. So let me express my self-energy in Vanier functions centered on atomic sites, capital R. Then the self-energy has an orbital index mm prime, an atom site index r r prime, and local means that I have a delta function in big R, big R prime. That means you have 
no self-energy components between different atomic sites, and the self-energy is, so to say, associated to a given atomic site. So today's topic of my talk will be an example where this is clearly not enough, namely where we need non-local correlations and introduce inter-site components, inter-atomic components of the self-energy, and these turn out to be important in the example that I will show you, strontium iridate. So my further outline is to give you a short introduction into the physics of strontium iridate and related compounds, and then first show you what single-site DMFT gives you for that. That means the approximation of really purely local self-energy and where and why it's not enough. And then we will go beyond and see what non-local self-energy is uh, introduced here. And finally, I uh, uh, will discuss the doped case and uh, interesting, quite simple picture of what experimentalists called a pseudogap here. Okay, this is really work by a former student of mine, Cyril Martins, and uh, postdoc uh, Benjamin Lenz. Strontium iridate crystallizes in the potassium nickel fluoride structure. That means you have essentially a layered perovskite that has additional distortions. So you have a layer of iridium uh, surrounded by X oxygen octahedra, and then you have rotations of these octahedra around the z-axis by 11 degrees. So that additional distortion on top of this structure. If it wasn't for that, it was exactly isostructural to the celebrated lanthanum copper oxide here, and also to the strontium ruthenate that Eva discussed this morning, I think. A little disclaimer, I neglect here possible additional distortions that experimentalists were discussing, um, because anyhow they, if present, should be really small. What is clear is that the compound is insulating at all temperatures. You see it in photoemission here, a gap at the Fermi level. You see it in the optical conductivity. You see it in transport. And insulating at all temperatures, all measured temperatures is important because in particular there is a magnetic transition at about 240 Kelvin, but essentially nothing happens in the resistivity at that temperature. So you have here this transition schematically. Below it's a canted antiferromagnetic phase. Above it's a paramagnetic phase, but everything is insulating. Our focus will be in particular here, even though at the end I will also show some data for the antiferromagnetic phase. Okay, when you talk about iridates, you might have second thoughts when you talk about correlations. Well, usually we tell you correlated materials are typically 3D oxides, 4F systems, because of the localized orbitals. Now, the localization, of course, decreases, or the, the spread increases when you go down in the periodic table. So a 5D orbital should be more extended and should be less prone to electronic Coulomb interactions. So in principle, you would expect weaker correlations in this class of material unless something else happens. And of course, here something else happens. Namely, what increases when you go down in the periodic table is the spin-orbit interaction. So the spin-orbit interaction of an iridium atom is of the order of other energy scales, hopping, spent with um, uh, Coulomb interactions uh, in this compound. And as we will see, this is actually an essential ingredient here. If I look just at the atom in the cage of the ox oxygen, I have a splitting of the 5D shell into T2G and EG. But now, if I add my spin-orbit coupling, it has been pointed out that the T2G shell is split again into uh, G, what people like to call a J-effective one-half state and a doublet of states, usually called J-effective three-half states. And it has been realized about 10 years ago that this kind of splitting by the spin-orbit interaction is actually a crucial element here. So a cartoon picture tells that, you know, well, even if Coulomb interactions are rel relatively moderate, if you apply them to a narrow J-effective one-half band here, you can split this band in upper and lower Hubbard bands and obtain a mod insulating state. So the recent literature I will not go through, don't worry. I will just focus a few highlights to motivate you further to investigate this compound. One of the uh, intriguing elements here is the close similarity to the cuprates, as has been pointed out in uh, different contexts here uh, by Central and Wang, who argued that the fact 
that it is described by a single orbital uh, model, namely for this J effective one half state, should indicate that it should cl be close to cuprate physics and maybe, maybe, maybe become superconducting. Experimentalists were then hunting in photo emission here for Fermi arcs. And even if the Fermi arcs got closed here to ellipses, the quest of finding superconductivity is still open. But until now, superconductivity remains elusive, at least in the sense of direct proof in terms of transport properties. OK, so far on a brief, very brief literature review. So our focus will be, in the first place, the paramagnetic phase here at high temperature. We start from the experimental crystal structure. And for that crystal structure, we perform just a DFT calculation. The result is here with the T2G states here with the reminiscent XY band going down here, which is uh, of larger bandwidth oxygen states down here. And the colors here are just a guide to the eye to indicate that slowly you might start to see that there is some package of band up here and some package of band here, even if there's no reason not to continue the, the band here and this one here. Note that there is four iridium in the unit cell and that these dark colored states here would therefore correspond to a single band per atom. Okay, let's first analyze this band structure a little bit further. As a theoretician, I can switch off things selectively and I can play. So let me undo the distortions and undo the spin orbit. Then I just have a band structure which looks very similar to the one of strontium rosonate. And I can selectively switch on either spin orbit or distortions or both. And you see how the backfolding of the bands comes in by the distortions, of course, and some rearrangements uh, by the spin orbit uh, coupling. What is important for us is now to see where are actually the bands corresponding to dominant J effective one half or three half character. So let's take this band structure and let's project it on the J effective one half and three half orbitals. The results are here. This is the J effective one half. These are the three halves. And here you see that while the three half one half states are indeed below the Fermi level, the three half three half are still quite around at the present at the Fermi level. That means they still carry a spectral weight. So at the DFT level, strictly speaking, this material is not yet a single orbital system, precisely because we are not talking just about levels, but the dispersion and the overlap here leads to still occupied three half states. So if I look at the numbers, then I would say that uh, if I do just LDA with the spin orbit coupling here, the three half, one half state is full, but this is not completely half filled and that is not completely full. So there's some charge uh, too much here and missing here. However, now I do my DMFT calculation and the result is actually in the first place that I clean up the three half states at the Fermi level and I have a charge transfer here from the J effective one half to the three half state, so that now both three half states are indeed filled with two electrons, and I end up at the end of the calculation with the state where I have a half filled J effective one half uh, state. So that means, starting just from the J effective one half single orbital model is a bit too quick, but after doing the calculation, this is actually what turns out to be the result. So when this, the system actually itself reduces effectively the degeneracy starting from all th uh, three T2G states, putting the correlations, and then goes to an effective single orbital state. Let's look at the spectral function. So this is the total spectral function, and these are the uh, one half and three half resolved states. So for the three half, of course, we don't need to plot the empty part because there's nothing. The three half orbital is filled. The one half is half filled, and in the total spectral function also you see the gap opening here. So we get the insulating state in the paramagnetic phase. Okay, I think I don't need the pedagogical uh, introduction to what is a spectral function. You can think of it very roughly up to matrix elements as uh, the quantity measured in photo emission or inverse photo emission. Where do I take out or where do I add an electron in these processes? 
Okay, so we get the insulating state, but how comes? And in particular, let's look at the little brother. The little brother is strontium rhodate. Isostructural, isoelectronic, exactly the same thing, apart from the fact that rhodium is a 4D transition metal and not a 5D one. The properties are completely different. Namely, strontium rhodate is a nice paramagnetic metal. So, first sanity check, what happens if we apply now our technique to that thing? Okay, let's first do the DFT. If I look at the band structure, the T2G manifold here seems a bit more narrow than in strontium iridate. That's worrying because you would think that correlations are stronger here. However, spin orbit splitting is smaller, so we don't know. We assessed the Coulomb interactions, and at first sight, surprisingly, but at second sight, actually, quite logically, I can come back to this, they are slightly smaller. And if we do the calculation, this is already the total spectral function. We indeed end up with a nice metallic state here, bands cutting the Fermi level. The blue dots are extracted from experiments from Felix Baumberger's group. Okay, here's also the orbital resolved picture, where you, see the, oops, where you see that what happened is that there's one of the three half states which sank below the Fermi level, and this has also been noted uh, by other authors before. In the two remaining orbitals, you keep charge, so the effective degeneracy is reduced from three T2G states to two T2G states, and one is actually eliminated in the process. Okay, you can enjoy the nice Fermi surface uh, in comparison to experiment. I will not dwell on this. Just let me point out, so why is strontium iridate insulating and strontium rhodate is not? Well, if you have a two orbital model, you need a much larger Coulomb interaction to localize the electrons because you have more kinetic energy. So the suppression of the effective degeneracy helps actually the system to go towards the insulating state. This is akin to what we found many years back actually with Eva in a series of vanadates and titanates where for different reasons, for structural reasons actually, one suppresses the degeneracy in these later titanates and then induces an insulator there. Same theme somehow. You suppress the degeneracy, kinetic energy is lowered and lower U is sufficient to induce the insulating state. Okay, this is very nice, but let's look a little bit more in detail at the spectral functions and let's compare with experiment. So this is actually photo emission, experimental data from Luca Perfetti and Veronique Poe. And the first thing to note is that they measure the first Boulogne zone and they measure the second Boulogne zone and find something quite different. So by definition, this is not present in just a theoretical spectral function, which has to be the same in the first and second Boulogne zone. So the difference here is a matrix element effect. One can rationalize this to some extent. I will not go into the details. For the moment, let me just retain that we should measure something at features where we have something here and at, feet, at, at positions where we have features here. So let me just see if I can roughly get the sum of these two. Well, the answer you see here is no. So we nicely have these parts here, which correspond to the three half states, but we are completely missing here the dispersion of the J effective one half state. So that is not at all well described in this single site description. So this is where the theme of the non local correlations comes in. Let's extend our theory to just, as a minimal model, include inter iridium fluctuations. So let's include uh, iridium iridium self energy. And we do so by really having a minimal model that is a dimer. The minimal cluster here is just two sites. And surprisingly, first sight surprisingly, this indeed fixes the problem. So now the result here shows you that we get nicely this very dispersive feature here, and this survives from the three half states. So the details of the spectral function, in particular the dispersion, indeed need here this cluster description because the inter iridium fluctuations seem to be important. You can compare more in detail with the experiment by looking at cuts now. So we, we fix an energy and look as a function of K. And this is experiment 
theory, experiment theory for different energies. So this agrees now very nicely. Okay, so now things are working so nicely in the pure compound. Let's become crazy. Let's start to dope it. So let's start to put electrons into the system. Now the system becomes a metal again. You have states around the Fermi level here. And let's look at the comparison to experiments. So in experiment, people pointed out that, okay, around the end point, there were very steep features, waterfall-like-ish stuff that was puzzling uh, in the experimental papers. Let's look what we get around the end point. So let's zoom in and let's plot in the same way as experimentalists do. So you should compare this one to this one and this one to this one. So the waterfallish like picture is just here, these, if I go back, the part that you had around here because you have two features actually showing up. Okay, let's look again at the spectral function and now around the M point. So you can see that what happens when you put electrons, they go here, that means you form an electron pocket around the M point. And this is actually of the form of an ellipse precisely as experimentalists had seen it. So this is the theoretical Fermi surface and this is the experimental one. So now let's look a bit further because experimentalists were saying here there is a pseudogap. If we follow spectral weight on the Fermi surface and we look at the as a function of energy at low energies, they were saying, okay, here if I look at angles, this is what they call zero degree and then 45 degree, so you follow the Fermi surface here, you plot the onset of spectral weight, they find a depletion right at the Fermi level, and they give you the size of the depletion as a pseudogap here. Let's do the same thing in theory. Well, we have spectral weight here and here, and we have a pseudogap. Okay, here also some kind of pseudogapish like feature. Well, where does this come from? Well, to some extent, let's look here. What experimentalists do, they take the spectral function that they measure, and first they symmetrize it, particle hole symmetry. And that means that actually if you do that on such a spectral function, which is not particle hole symmetric at all, you will just pick up this band again up on the other side of the uh, Fermi level, and it looks like you have a pseudo gap. Second issue is, and this is what we got from our cluster DMFT, because we were actually taking care of not breaking the symmetry, so we do the cluster in twice in both directions and average in such a way that we do not break the point group symmetry of the crystal. And that means we actually, in the theory, get a kind of superposition of two ellipses, meaning that at the very end you have a depletion coming precisely from these inter-site fluctuations that you can interpret as the antiferromagnetic coupling between the iridium. Okay, so now my time is up, despite of the fact that... Ah, okay, so it's my five minutes. Okay, okay, I stopped late, you realized, right? Okay, okay, nevertheless, so my time is up. So that means I don't show you the antiferromagnetic phase, just enjoy that the, f the experimental points are on top of the theory. Uh, and I don't show you barium, that doesn't matter, you can ask me over coffee. So I let you read my summary, thanks a lot. <laughs>